Let me give you some scenarios here to flesh out some of the conceptuals that we have. Tunisia, as I said, I think we're moving towards, again, this is all to be taken lightly, reform through participation. We've seen this opening that I was mentioning, a large number of actions, quite large in fact, it's good the larger the better. The value in this particular mode, as we've seen elsewhere, based on again, combinations of regional experiences, is that it creates a self-balancing system, over time, of course, and over experiences. By a virtue of having a large number of actors, it balances itself. In Egypt, we have had a different process, which is more painful, more difficult. It's through transaction. We have this process between stronger actors, the military, obviously. And here, what you need to have is the social base of power to expand. Gradually, it takes time. This is what we're seeing today in Egypt. This debate and all of this factionism and engagement. It might sometimes think that it's one step forward, two step backwards, and it's very difficult. But in fact, it's not a process that is completely doomed, as sometimes we might think. The, the key idea is the, the second one, which is that the leadership leading the transition has to decide whether to go along or to prevent it. And this is the key question that has to be answered yes or no. Think specifically here, of course, about the Egyptian military over the past couple of months. Now, if you were to ask me, I think that they have been more negative than positive, and that I think they've been forced many times to go along. But the choice that they have to make vis-a-vis -vis that process is fundamental obstruction or to go along. Finally, the, the rupture process, which is akin to, but not exactly what they had in Latin America, the ruptura pactada, pact and rupture. Here's a, a variant on it, because the rupture essentially in Libya came from outside. The revolution was midwifed by NATO. Let's call it what it is, fundamentally. Which is really the question today in Syria. Can Syria succeed only as a Syrian story, or will it need some push from outside? And if it does, what will be the implications for that? And this is the main question today for the Syrians, to really be wary of what took place in Libya. The, the main question there is the following. You have everybody opposed to Gaddafi. Equal opportunity, hatred, and opposition to Gaddafi, the system, everything. Once he's out, as he is, then you need to replace that by an alternative project, which is the transition project. And the question is, has Libya done that? Yes or no? My sense is not yet, so far. As a, proactive, forward-looking, forward movement as such. The easy aspect of the fall of Qaddafi makes it more difficult for them to build a future as such. And the more violent the previous system was, as certainly Qaddafi was, the more difficult will be the process. Some of the key aspects are these. I will go through them quickly. We've seen them. The role of the military and the Islamists are fundamental to this. I will highlight the weakness of the political parties. Surprisingly, they have not been too strong. There's a reason for that. I think by the 90s, they were really emasculated, weakened by a lot of these actors. Let me move towards some scenarios. We shouldn't have projections, but we're going to have some anyway. <laughs> Tunisia, it's a little bit this in the future, potentially a gradual setting of democratic institutions. In Egypt, certainly a highly uncertain transition. Incomplete revolution or uncertain transition for you to, dis to decide and make up your mind. Libya, another question mark. Stabilization quickly now with the elections and moving towards all of the things we've seen to, of, for a transition or instability. This can happen. Atomization by virtue of everyone thinking about their own process. Yemen is a little told, relatively successful story, in fact, where they've been able to negotiate the exit, strangely enough, of Ali Abdullah Saleh, he left, he came back, and then he left. But at the end of the day, they have started. The only problem is that there's a perennial instability in Yemen, which we've seen even this week, which is continuing. Are they able to deal with that chronic instability in a lasting manner or not? Syria, I think, is, is for me, is a bit of a, of a looking, looking pretty bad, in fact. I don't know, I mean, I'd like to hear from you, but I, I, I can envision a positive outcome only with difficulty, and there's some reason for that. And when we can discuss the other examples, Algeria, how come nothing is happening in Algeria, we can discuss this. But for the sake of time, I'm going to go quickly through some security forecast. Not political. Here, I'm testing this on you to be a little bit provocative. Analogies. Iraqization of Libya. You can have insecurity, 
division arms. Or you can have stability, as we see. Syria, paradoxically, can become Lebanonized, meaning that the Lebanon of the 70s and 80s, the insecurity, Beirut as one of the most dangerous places in the world, can paradoxically become what Syria is. Civil war, as we have seen it, interference, and so on. Egypt can become a form of Pakistan. You know, Pakistan is a bit of a democracy. They have elections regularly, it takes place. But what the main story in Pakistan is the opposition between the Islamists, who are throughout the system, even with insecurity, uh, officers and the military. And think about all of the Ziaul uh, Haq leader and most recently Pervez Musharraf and all of this tradition of leaders that have been able to direct the process. Finally, related, but not part of the Arab world of course, is Mali being kind of impacted by this in a way that it becomes another, not Afghanistan as sometimes is mentioned because there's no front there, but more of a Som Somalia. So these are some security Elements that I would like to highlight. Libya in particular is here because of this. Militias, the Tuareg Rebellion, uh, Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, which has been there before the revolution, of course, arms proliferations, and all kinds of drug trades. I'm going to skip those elements about insecurity for the sake of time. Just take a look at what Mali looks like today, by the way. It's already de facto divided. It's a de facto country. And at this story is a Half of it is about Mali itself and the Tuareg rebellion and desire for emancipation, but half of it is also about what came from Libya and the impact, by the way, let's not be naive about this, is underneath the Tuareg area, for instance, is the Taudeni oil and gas basin. If you think about all of these geostrategic elements, they're there. This is a very oil rich area. This is why you have all of this noise. It's not simply by virtue of that. Underneath that, there's a lot of developments that you might be, you should be aware of. Take a look at British, US positioning in and around Sudan, Chad, all of this region. These are re, this is a repositioning about oil, about strategy, about this. This, this is part of the real politics that we have to be aware of, uh, mentioning this in relation to Syria, for instance. Yemen, I mentioned a minute ago, is also in the same system. This is from two months ago. Look how it looks now. Essentially, this is transitioning, but you have AQPA, by the way, is a Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So you have also the Houthi rebellion, the separatist, uh, AQAP, and, and also its own Ansar al-Sharia, a new uh, offshoot of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. You have all of these actors. What does that come from is how it looks like this. The security outlook, and this is really something that we have to explain very carefully. It's not because of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a positive event. I have this discussion all the time about policymakers. It's a fantastic, positive event that needed to happen, that was going to happen anyway. But transitions have in themselves something that brings in stability. And when it does bring in stability, those that position themselves around that are those that have the ability to do that. Either major powers, take a look at some of the flags positioning themselves, or of course, non-state actors that can do that. The grammar of international relations element that I studied. So, it's not the e-revolutionaries that don't even have a political party that can do that so easily. It's those that are more equipped that can do that in relation to this. But ultimately, penultimate slide, I promise, this is what this is about. For me, the Arab Spring is about this line here, the yellow, the wall, the relationship to power that needs to change, expectations, the look in the eye of this kid, about a military that should be represented, legitimate, part of the expression of the ethos of that society and not something feared. And I think this wall is crumbling in relation to that. So that now we have essentially a sense of these elements that I would like to end with. First of all, the Arab Spring has no more than the latest episode of the post-colonial history of the area. It's the continuation, it's the most recent phenomenon. There's a lot of dysfunctioning patterns that we have to process, understand, authoritarianism, all of these issues that we've covered. There's a number of drifts having to do with security that take place behaviorally, that are materializing. The external involvement is key and we have to understand that properly without drifting to conspiracy theory because it's a reality of it. There's a fluidity to the repositioning which is interesting. It can actually generate new interesting alliances or it can actually 
delay the transition. And more importantly, transitions are unpredictable. We can desire for more democracy and opening, but it's a phase, as I said. In this phase, we have to understand it so that we can work better with it and hopefully generate more such um, equipped, democratically equipped citizens. I thank you for your attention. You guys have been very patient. Thank you.